So today's Father's Day. Yeah, we got some dads here. We got some dads here, a few of them. Amen. God bless you. Like PJ said, we've got a gift for you in, in the lobby when you, when you leave. But I want to take some time to talk about a father that's even more important than any of us. And that's our Heavenly Father. You know, if we were to put our dads on a, on a scale of like 1 to 10, you know, each one of us would you know, have somewhere on the scale we would place our, our dad. You know, for some of us, we maybe didn't even know who our dad was. And so it might even be like zero, you know, didn't, didn't even know who he is. But could be, uh, you know, you might say 10. But for most of us, we're probably somewhere in the middle, up or down from there a little bit, because there's no perfect dads in the world. Obviously, only God, our Father, is perfect. So one of the issues that you and I deal with is that we often compare whatever our natural experience has been with our fathers to our Father in heaven. It's just natural for us to do that. So in other words, if, if we had a healthy, wholesome kind of relationship with our Father, then often what happens is, you know, our connection with God is a little bit easier. But if we had maybe an abusive relationship, or, or we felt unloved or uncared for at times, or maybe abandoned at times, all of a sudden then, sometimes that thinking, because of our experience, kind of diffuses into our relationship with the Lord. Now here's what I want to tell you, that regardless of whether you had that dad that's near the zero, or the dad that's near the 10, you've got to put all those experiences aside. Because here's why. Even if you had the worst dad in the world, okay, obviously that's going to affect your relationship with the Lord, obviously, if, if you allow it to. But even if you have the 10 dad, you know, the one that you believe is perfect, let me tell you, he wasn't perfect because there's no one that's perfect. The Bible even says all of sin to fall short of the glory of God. So here's the problem. If you equate that, that dad that was in your life to your heavenly father, no matter how good he was, you are going to limit your father in heaven. You're going to limit him. And so you literally have to lay all that aside and instead of experientially knowing who God is through, through your natural father, you now have to go to the word. You have to say, this Bible, this word, shows me who Father is to me. And that's why it's so important for us to realize what's in the Bible, to read it. Because if we don't read it, if we don't take it in and soak it in, we will not understand what our Heavenly Father's like. And then we, we default to our natural fathers. And I see this over and over again in counseling when I counsel people. I see this over and over again. You know, the, their pitfalls, the things that they're dealing with. When I really dig into it, it's... Back to their dad or their grandfather. And you get what I'm saying? In other words, it's just history repeating itself. And that's not what God has for you and I. God has something better. And our Father in heaven is a perfect dad in every way. And it's our job to spend our life discovering more and more about that perfect father. And so, yeah, you're going to compare to your natural dad about it. But here's the thing. You're not going to default to your natural dad. You're going to default to your heavenly father. That's what God has called us to do. So not only has God done that, but, but here's the thing. The Bible says that we've been adopted into his family. So let's just have a look at scripture and begin to, to take this apart. And I want to just encourage you this morning. So Galatians chapter 4, beginning of verse 6. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. See, today I want to talk to you about inheriting God's promises, your father's promises. See, there's an inheritance available for you. And how many people want all that God has for them? I, I hope all your hands are going up here, at home, everywhere. Of course we do. But I believe that many of us, including myself, fall short of all that God has for us. And that's what I want to help you with today. But if you could put that scripture up, look at verse 6 for a moment. Let's begin to just look at this. It says, and because we are his children. Okay, let's stop right there. Okay, one of the issues in the world today is that there are people who say, well, everyone on the earth are God's children. Okay, that's a lie. That's a lie. You must accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to become a child of God. You know, there are people in the world that will say, well, everyone goes to heaven if you're a good person. You know, as long as you try to do your best. That's a lie. All right, we need to take God at his word. 
And it says that you must accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then you are declared a son or a daughter. All right? In other words, you become one of his children. And I know that sounds harsh. That sounds hard. It even Some people would say it sounds narrow-minded. But here's the reality of it. It's simple. There's only one way to the Father, and that's through the Son. Simple, clear, and concise. And so as we look at this, because we are his children, I ask you this question. Are you his child today? I pray all of you are. And if you're not, if there's anyone here that's never accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, it's as simple as inviting him in. Right now, right where you're seated. Right there, right now. If you're at home, it, you could do it on your couch. You know, if you're, you're laying in bed, you know, just watching on a big screen. Listen to me. Right there, you can just say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my heart. I turn from my ways and I want to follow you. Help me from this point on. And you become immediately a child of God. In fact, as a result of being his child, here's what God does. He sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now, I love this because in this one verse, you have the spirit, the son, and the father. All three of the Trinity are right there. Isn't that amazing? It's pretty cool, right? And so here's the deal. You accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The spirit of God, spirit of Jesus, comes and lives in you to such a point that the spirit in you cries out, Abba, Father. You might say, well, Abba, what does that mean? I thought that was the name of a group from Sweden, from the, what, 70s or 80s, right? Yeah, no, no, it's not that, okay? The word Abba is actually a Greek word, and it means father. In fact, it's been translated here. In fact, so Abba, it's actually the, the word, all right? And it, so it's saying the Greek word Abba meaning father. So we have both translations in a sense right there now here's the thing it's not the great divine creator of all the universe kind of father although god is that right but this is talking about a compassionate loving caring parent literally that concerned about your every need wanting to minister to you wanting to help you in the natural and in the spirit and so when we cry out, Abba, Father, in fact, we had a, a Jewish family that was in our church a number of years ago, and, and it struck me as odd, but one of the little kids ran up to his dad and said, Abba, Abba, Abba. I'm like, Abba, what's that all about? Didn't, I didn't have any idea. He, and what they're saying in the original language is, is Daddy, Daddy. It's a term of endearment. And so when Jesus comes into our heart, all of a sudden there's this personal relationship or connection that begins to happen. Okay, so move to verse 7. As a result of that, here's what happens. And because of that, you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. You see, if you read the context of the scripture in Galatians, it talks about being a slave to this world. And that's what all of us were at one time. Before Jesus came into our lives, we were a slave driven by the way this world operates. But now we have a choice. We have the choice to accept Jesus into our lives. We have the choice no longer to be a slave, but to be what? A child, son and daughter of the Lord, creator of heavens and earth. But not only that, one who cares for you. Wow. Now here's the thing. When God adopts us, it's not like the world does it now. You know, uh, people get adopted and, and often they, they, they don't even take the name of the family. Uh, often, they, you know, and, and that's okay. I, I get all that. But you need to understand that when this was written, it was written in the context of how things happened in, in Rome. Because obviously Rome was in charge at that time over Israel. So let me give you some examples. If, if a, a Roman leader, a Roman soldier, for example, had a slave, and, and maybe that slave saved their life or, or just was really faithful. There are times where that, that Roman leader or soldier would adopt that person. So here's what would happen. That person literally would, you know, leave all their clothes off, you know. They would literally get a set of clothes that were Roman clothes. They would actually get a completely new name, it's often a first and last new name, and they would become the benefactors of everything that Roman soldier or leader had. In other words, they literally became the son or daughter of, of that Roman, Roman soldier or leader. And they weren't worried about their past, their anything, because they recognized that it was nothing before, and now I am a child of this individual. That's you and I with God the Father. Regardless of where you've come from, it's where you're going that's important, right? And so as we've been adopted, it's like a Roman way of adoption. That literally, In fact, the Bible says you've been given a new name. 
You can read it in several places in scripture. So he, he, it literally lines up with that way of thinking. And so since you are his child, now here's the good part. What's it say now? God has made you his what? Heir. That means all that he has is available to you. So when I read a scripture like this, here's what I say. Well, am I experiencing that? Am I experiencing all the things that is in heaven? Am I experiencing all the blessings, all the promises, all the inheritance that God has for me? And I have to honestly look at you and say, I'm not experiencing all of it, but I want to. Is there anyone else in that same boat? You know, you, you recognize there's an inheritance, you recognize there's more, and you want more. Any, anybody here feel that way? All right, I see a few hands. Uh, the other guys must be asleep or I lost them somewhere along the way. But anyway, you know, my heart is that, that that's what we want, right? And so I've been praying about this for about four weeks. And I'm just thinking about this and mulling it over. And I'm like, well, Lord, there obviously must be a, a disconnect. There must be something that I'm missing if I'm not experiencing all that God has, all the inheritance that God has for me, then there's something I'm missing. I, I'm, I haven't arrived yet, or there's, there's something going on. And I know you're perfect, so where's that, where's that leave the problem? <laughs> yeah, first person you see in the mirror in the morning, right? Uh, you know, I'm the problem, or, or, or there's something that has to happen in my life. So as I prayed about this, the Lord showed me this really cool concept, and I shared it at the first service, and I, I, think, I think the nickel dropped. I think most people got it. My hope is that you can come to a deeper place so that you can receive the inheritance God has for you. And part of it, before I even get into my points, is this. It's maturity. Even when you read in the Galatian scripture that we just read, if you expand on the chapter, it talks about the fact that, that a son is still really treated as a slave until they come to maturity. In other words, there's tutors over them. There's people guiding them and directing them. You know, I was thinking, PJ, you know, if I gave PJ a million dollars, he'd spend it, right? But how well would he spend it? Would he be a good steward with that million dollars? No one wants to answer, right? We, we don't. <laughs> PJ's gone to kids' church, so he's gone now. So we can be honest, right? <laughs> you, you, you get what I'm saying? In other words, he, he's not what? At a level of maturity to understand what to do with that. And so... Everything I'm going to talk about is on the premise that we've all come to a place of maturity in our walk, that we understand that we have to bow the knee to the Lord. And this is just, that, that, that's just so, so important. So as I began to unpack this in my own heart, my mind, I began to think about Abraham. And you might think, well, Abraham, he's a guy that was born 4,000 years ago. How can he be relevant to us right now? Well, here's, here's the circumstance. In the New Testament, he is referred to as the father of our faith. Kind of like the patriarch of, of what Christianity was going to become. And so he had a bunch of firsts happen in his life. For example, in Genesis 15 verse 6, the Bible says that God took him outside and showed him all the stars in the heaven. He said, you see all these stars? Well, as many stars as you can see, so shall your descendants be. And he showed him the, the sand on, on the shore of, of the sea. And he said, you know, just as the sand is on the shore, so shall your descendants be. And the Bible says this in, in Genesis 15, verse 6, that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It's the first time in the Bible that the word faith is used. See, the word believe, faith, same, same word in the original language. The first time. So that's a first. And that's one of the main reasons why he is called the father of our faith. Because he's the first one that believed God at his word. And so there's another first that happened. And, and this is actually uh, beforehand. And it's in Genesis 14. I, I want to get the quote right. Genesis 14 verse 13. And there was a, a reference for the very first time in the Bible. And it says this. That Abraham the Hebrew. And then it goes on to talk about something. It's the very first time that Abraham is called a Hebrew. And I, and I, I looked at that and I said well. I wonder if there's any significance to that. Well, guess what? There's no extra words in the Bible, right? There's significance to everything in the Bible. But as you look that up and study that word, the word Hebrew actually means the one who crossed over. And so Abraham actually means prince. So the prince who crossed over. If you study the life of Abraham, here's a guy coming from Ur of the Chaldeans, you know, a place where they sacrificed babies on altars, the horrible things they did. And so what did he do? He left there and did what? crossed over into the promised land. He left that way of life. He, he died to that manner of life and went 
a new direction and crossed over. And that word crossed over doesn't usually mean cross like over top of a mountain. It actually means to descend and go through waters. So it usually means going through a river. So that's when crossing over, it's referring to a river. So I got thinking about all this, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I began to think of all the different individuals and groups that had crossed over physically over the Jordan River to go to the promised land. And all of a sudden, I just had all kinds of light bulbs exploding in, in my head, in my heart, of the Lord showing me three truths that you and I need to have to cross over into our inheritance, into our promised land. And so I just want to take you to those three points. There's just a couple of scriptures and show you this. And hopefully, by seeing that, you might be able to get a little more of your inheritance today. How many people say amen to that? Amen? All right. So here's, here's our first scripture. This is in Joshua chapter 3. And in this case, children of Israel have been out in the wilderness for, for 40 years. So there they are, you know, and, and they could have done it in 40 days, but because of disobedience, they're out there in the wilderness. And now it's time to cross over. And Joshua is leading them across. So let's look at what happens. Joshua 3, verse 13. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest on the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. And so this, this is what happened. Literally, as the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant down into the Jordan River, as they just touched the edge of the water, the water just started to move to either side. It's pretty cool, right? And they stepped out, and they stayed there holding the Ark of the Covenant for the entire time while a million plus people crossed over to the other side. Now, I'm going to be quite honest with you. I have been to the Jordan River. Anybody else been to the Jordan River? All right. I've got to be quite honest with you. It was a bit underwhelming. In fact, the stream isn't much more than our pond out here flowing out. It, it really isn't a whole lot of water. And so to be honest with you, I'm like, I read accounts like this, I'm like, oh, what's the big deal? I could just like, just walk across and like, get your feet wet. What's the big deal? Well, here's the reality of it. The Jordan River we see today is not the same Jordan River that was back at that time. There's a couple things that have happened. Obviously, you know, the, the earth is getting a little bit drier. That's one thing. But the, actually, the biggest thing is irrigation because it's the main river. It's 150 miles long, 156 miles long. It runs from Mount Hermon because that's literally where all the snow melts, and it starts there, comes down, goes 156 miles, and flows into the Dead Sea or, or the Salt Sea. And so all the farmers on each side have been drawing water off it. So, so it used to be 20, 30 times, 40 times the size that we see it now. Plus, when you read it in context, the scripture I just read, it was at flood stage. So literally, it would look a little more like the Hudson River. In other words, it, 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 you know, hundreds and hundreds of meters wide, maybe 30, 40 feet deep at least. So it was a big river to cross. You couldn't cross it. You know, the, the flood stage, the current would be so strong, literally people would have perished. And so this was a necessary thing. So we look back at the circumstance. So the Ark of the Covenant goes down. Well, what was the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in it were the Ten Commandments. There were some other things. Uh, the mercy seat was on top of it. But here's the thing. Essentially, the beginning of the Bible was in there. All right? Essentially, it represented the Word. You know, it was called the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. All right? We could actually say Ark of the Testimony. Now, I want you to think about this. You know, Ark of the Testimony, that's not too far away from last will and testament. In other words, in it represents everything of God at that point. And so it goes down and is held there, and everyone can cross over. Okay. So here's my first point. For you to inherit what God has for you, you need to understand the covenant you have with God. It was the covenant that made a way so that they could cross over. So do you know what your covenant says? Do you know what the last will and testament of God has for you? It's in here. There's thousands, thousands upon thousands of promises contained within the scriptures that are available that are a part of your inheritance. And so to begin to cross over, the first thing you have to recognize is that you were brought across into your inheritance through the word of God. That's the first point. I encourage you, put that in your heart and know that. So if you feel, man, Lord, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I'm not getting the inheritance. I, what do I do here? It begins through studying the word. It begins through meditating on it. It begins to understand 
through understanding who your father is from heaven. All right, let's move on. All right, the next time, this is a few hundred years later, there's a guy by the name of Elijah. How many people have heard of Elijah? Yeah, he, he was a kind of a tough, crusty old guy who, who was just, he was, he was dealing with a hard-headed bunch of people, all right, at this time. So when you look at some of the things he did, it's like, whoa, this guy was extreme. But the thing is, sometimes you need tough people for tough times. But he was getting near the end of his life, and, and he knew that he'd be leaving soon. And so God spoke to him and said, look, you, you need to mentor a new person. And so he goes and gets this person, and God shows him who it is, and it's Elisha. So we have Elijah, you know, is mentoring Elisha. And so we're near the point now where I'm going to read is where Elijah is going to leave. And so he tells Elisha, hey, you stay here, I'm going over here. And Elisha says, no way. I'm going to stick with you to the end. And so he keeps following around. They go through a whole bunch of towns and places. But here's what they do. They actually cross the Jordan out of the promised land. So they go through the opposite direction that we've been talking about, out. And so this chariot comes down from heaven, and there's this giant whirlwind, and the chariot comes between the two men. And the Bible says Elijah gets caught up in the whirlwind and goes up to heaven. And his mantle drops off him. In other words, his cloak representing that he's a prophet drops to the ground. So Elisha goes and grabs it. And so we're going to pick up the story from there. Just a couple of verses. It's in 2 Kings 2, beginning at verse 13. He, meaning Elisha, took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. And it's not, I didn't read this, but when Elijah went the other way, he split the water to go through that way as well. Just so everybody knows, they didn't have to get wet going one way. So what, what is this all about? Well, here's the thing. You can't get your inheritance through somebody else. You have to cross over. This is a personal thing. This is about you and God. You know, it's fine to have people that you follow and, and you know, maybe you're following somebody online, you know, some ministry or whatever, or you're reading books. All of that is fine. But when the day comes to an end, all they can do is inspire you. You know, here I am, I'm up here, what am I trying to do? You know, I'm trying to inspire you. I wave my arms around, I try to keep your attention, I try to say, hey, you know, Jesus loves you. You know, that's ultimately a fact. If that's all you remember today, remember that, all right? But, so, but, but here's the thing, I can't get your inheritance for you and hand it to you. What, but what I can do is say, hey, here's what the Word says, here's what I believe the Spirit of God is saying right now. Now you need to go and get your inheritance, and literally, as I see Elisha crossing over, he has to do it what? He has to call upon the Lord, and he has to do it. And it's the same for you and I. And so you may have some great people, some great mentors in your life, people encouraging you, but ultimately, when the day is over, it's you and Jesus, and you being able to hear from him in a personal way. Can I get an amen out of that? So, so important, amen? Okay, so covenant, that's the first one, right? Knowing what the word says, knowing uh, who your father is in heaven. And then next, it's a personal thing. It's something you have to do with him. All right, the final point is this, and we're gonna jump over into the New Testament. And so we're going to Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter one, beginning at verse four. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remissions of sin. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So as I look at this, uh, first of all, I, I just want to connect some dots for you. I've, written, I, I, I've read three different accounts talking about the Jordan River. And you know I mentioned it's about 156 miles long. Here's the thing. It appears, both traditionally and historically, it appears that all three of these events happened in the same place of the Jordan River. Isn't that cool? 
All these things, this crossing over place appears to all be just outside of Jericho. Just the same place where, where Joshua crossed over in the first place. I, I find that very, very interesting. And so here we have, we didn't have the waters parting, did we? But we had individuals going down into the Jordan and coming up out of the Jordan again. And what was, their, what was the purpose of all that? What was John's baptism? It was what, a baptism of repentance. And, and, you know, often when we think of the word repent, you know, we think of a, you know, repent you filthy rotten sinner, that kind of thinking. And the thing is, yes, if you're a filthy rotten sinner, you should repent. But, but that's not how we should think about this. The word repent literally means if you're going in this direction, to turn and start going in the other direction. That's literally what the word repent means. And so it's not just physically repenting. That's not what I mean, you know, it, it, like if I'm walking this way and turning. I'm using that as an illustration. But with thinking. In other words, you're thinking in a certain direction. You're thinking a certain way. To repent just means to change your way of thinking. That's literally what it means. And so that's what John was preaching. A baptism of repentance. Why? In preparation for the coming of Jesus. Because their thinking had to change to receive Jesus. Just like a, a person accepts Jesus for the first time. Their thinking before accepting Jesus is, I can do this myself. And there has to be what? A change of thinking to say, I can't do this myself. I need Jesus to help me. And so that's repentance. And it's at all different levels. We repent when we first accept Jesus. And I hope we're all living a life of repentance. Because that's what God has called us to do. And in fact, that brings me to, to the third point. That, that here, here they are going into the Jordan and coming out. And for them to cross over to the, to the new life that John was speaking about. Which was be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They had to do what? Repent. They had to change their attitude. Now let's read on just a little bit. I just want you to see something in verse 9. It says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw heavens parting, the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the first question I've got for you is this. Did Jesus need to repent of anything? No, absolutely not. So as we read and study this out, we find that he did it as an act of righteousness. He did it as an example for you and I. So as he went down into the waters and came out, what happened? We just read about it. It says that the heavens were parted. So instead of the Jordan being parted, heavens were parted. Now you'll notice that I'm just reading a scripture from the New Testament. The first two I was reading from the Old Testament. See, the Old Testament is a foreshadowing, a shadow of the New Testament. In other words, it's through natural life examples of what the Spirit is telling us in the New Testament. And so the first two talked about a physical river, the Jordan splitting and, and different events happening, right? And here now I'm talking about heaven opening. See, I'm here to tell you today that one of the issues that all of us deal with is that we're looking for our inheritance in the natural. We're looking for houses and cars and money and titles and all those kinds of things. And, and there's nothing wrong with those things in their place. But where our inheritance is, is where? In heaven. And in fact, it says this, that once heaven was parted, what happened? A voice spoke from heaven. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That is our inheritance, is a relationship, a personal relationship with God. And you might say, well, well, hold it. You know, I've been taught that God wants to bless me in the natural. I got no issue with that. But the Bible does say this, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. That everything else is the houses and the cars, whatever you need for life. But it's not to be our focus or our priority. Heaven is now our inheritance. Our relationship with God in a personal way is our inheritance. And with that, everything else gets added on. That's easy for God. See, if you know the voice of God, if you, you hear him and know what he's got for you, you just show up at the right place at the right time, and it's just given to you. If you, you understand what I'm saying. The problem is that so often we want the stuff, and then after we get the stuff, we're like, oh, okay, God, you know, thanks for blessing me. Now I'll talk to you. doesn't work that way. Works out of seeking him first, growing in him first, and then the other stuff comes along. Okay, I've said an awful lot. I want to refine 
this entire time together into four words. Do you think I can do it? I can. I did it at the first service and was successful. They were the guinea pig experiment people, and we, we did it. Okay, so let me give you four words to describe what I'm trying to encapsulate here this morning, all right? So they're going to put them up. To inherit your father's promises. There's four words, four simple words. Covenant, personal, repentant, and heaven. So to inherit your father's promises, you need to understand the covenant agreement. You need to understand what the word says concerning your father, the promises that he has for you. The next thing you have to realize is it's personal. You can't get it by reading a book. Now again, a book can inspire you and encourage you. Can't get it from the best preachers in the world. And again, they can inspire you and encourage you. But ultimately, when the day is over, you've got to cross over under your own steam, so to speak. Under your own anointing, out of your own personal relationship. Finally, you have to have a repentant heart. You have to have an attitude of submission to your father. If you really want all that God's got for you, it could be that you got to let go of some baggage so that you can grab hold of what he's got for you. Makes sense, right? And then finally, we need to re remind ourselves that our main inheritance isn't down here. It's up there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't mean in, in the by and by. I'm not making any suggestion here that, that your inheritance is, well, you know, there, there's a mansion in heaven. And that's all true. There, there's, that, that's there. What I'm talking about is that your eyes have to be heavenward. Your focus has to be heavenward to the throne room of God where God is so that you can know what his will is down here so you can deal with the inheritance that's down here, that's manifesting down here for you, amen? So here's the thing. At the first service, Don Lord, who is a very special individual, love him dearly. I've known him for 30, 30 plus years. He has a very interesting way at looking at things. He's an engineer by trade, so he, so he can see things that others can't. So he looked at these uh, four words. He says, oh, man, I got this figured out. I'm like, well, just tell me. He says, well, let's look at it this way. You know, the C and the P and the R. CPR, if you do CPR, you get to go to heaven. Yeah, and so that, that was his uh, take on it. So listen, if you need, in your mind, remember CPR, heaven, <laughs> whatever works for you, all right? So this leaves us really with a question. You see those four words that are up there. Is there one or more of those that are hanging you up? In other words, maybe you're having an issue in trusting God at his word. Maybe you're a little weak on the personal thing. In other words, uh, you know, you, you listen to other people and you hear about their relationship with God and you're like, man, I, I wish I had that, but, but you don't really cultivate that relationship for yourself. Maybe you do know what the word says and you, you read a, uh, a command in there and it says don't do this or do this. And you're like, nah, I'm not going to do that. But you know in your heart of hearts you need to. And then finally, I think of the last one of heaven that sometimes we become so earthly focused like the world that we forget that our main inheritance is eternal in value and in nature. And our focus is wrong. Now, as I'll, I look at all four of those, I think I could put my hands up in all four areas, honestly. So let's take a minute and stand together, those that are here. And if you're at home, I encourage you to do this as well. But just with every head bowed, just for a minute. Do you feel a little stuck on any one of these or more? Just slip your hand up in the air. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or anything. You know, my hands are up. Here's what I know. You can put your hands down. Here's what I know. God has some amazing things for all of us. Some are general things, you know, that we see listed in the Word. But there are specific things uniquely tailored for you. Your special inheritance that no one else has. It's, it's just for you. And so, Lord, right now, you saw all those hands raised here, and I'm sure some watching online did the same thing. I pray, Lord, right now in Jesus' name that, that we would get unstuck that we would come to a place of just surrendering to you, that, that we would begin to understand our Abba Father to a deeper level. Knowing that all of heaven is there, all of the resources of heaven is available. Heaven is open, and nowhere in Scripture does it say it closed again. <laughs> it's open to stay. And so, Lord God, I pray that we begin with a right heart to cross over into all that you have for us. 
I pray, Lord God, that our attitude would be right, that, that Lord God, we, we'd have repentant hearts in any area that needs to be that way. That, Lord God, that we would know that we have to do this in our own strength. There are things that others can help us with. But there are other things that we have to cross over in our own strength. But, Lord, you give us the anointing and the ability to do so. So I speak a blessing over your people right now. Those here physically, those watching online, those that will watch maybe a, a day, a week, a month, a year from now. That this message would be as relevant as it was this very morning. Because your word is eternal in nature. So again, bless your people as they look to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you this morning. If you have any prayer needs, please feel free to text us. God bless.